Before we start, if you're enjoying these conversations, please make sure that you like or subscribe to Cleaning Up. It really helps other people to find us. Cleaning Up is brought to you by the Liebreich Foundation and the Gilardini Foundation. Hello, I'm Michael Liebreich, and this is Cleaning Up. My guest today is Laurence Tubiana. Since 2017, she's been the CEO of the European Climate Foundation. In 2014, she was appointed by President Hollande as France's climate change ambassador and special representative to the Paris climate change negotiations. She's regarded as one of the key architects of the Paris Agreement. Please welcome Laurence Tubiana to Cleaning Up. So, Laurence, welcome to Cleaning Up. It's absolutely fantastic to see you. That's very, very nice to see you again, Michael. I'm very happy and it's very good memories for many years now. That's right. I was thinking in preparation for this conversation, I actually dived in and tried to find uh, our first interactions and where we first met. It was actually in Berlin in uh, 2013. Um, Germany was launching something called the Renewables Club. Do you remember that? Yeah, I remember that, yeah. It was going to be the club to save the world. Um, mm. and, um, and I think it sort of disappeared a year or two later. I'm not sure it went very far, but you and I met and uh, we then worked on a number of things uh, after that, didn't we? Yeah, absolutely. I remember your incredible presentation in the small offices of Idria Transpo, and then you described how we can mobilize finance for climate and why it was not that difficult. And of course, you were thinking about the green bonds and, and the capacity of leveraging. It was, I think, 20, 2008, 2000, maybe 12 or, or 13. Uh, that, that would have been 2000. I think it would have been 2014. Um, yeah, maybe around there, because I think because the other person who was an Idri at that point was Teresa Ribera, who was yes, our was guest true. on episode 37. And Teresa yeah. was in the room as well. I remember that. And so it must have been after she was out of office the first period. So it must have been around that sort of 13, yeah, yeah, exactly. 14. Exactly. And um, that's right, because I had this crazy plan um, to refinance the the, the, the the World Bank and the multilaterals should refinance rather than just putting money to work and then sitting there, that they should then sell on into exactly. a, I call it a big green bucket. And I was trying to get yeah, you yeah, yeah, yeah. That's excited what, about that. I think, well, it, they have not been totally convinced still, but I think you, it's, the idea is progressing. The idea is progressing. It was, it's very interesting because the reaction I got at the time was pretty much when I talked, when I got in to talk to people, you know, on the inside of those institutions, um, that, you know, uh, the development banks, whether it was um, African Development Bank, IADB, World Bank, but particularly the World Bank, um, it was, what do you know? You're an outsider. How could you possibly know? And it's like, well, I know banking balance sheets. I know what, what normal banks do. They don't sit on loans forever. Um, <laughs> when that loan increases in value because the risk drops, they, you know, they, they, they recycle their capital. Um, but I got kind of an allergic reaction and pushed out. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure that's a good discussion you have had with Richard Kite, which of course always has pushed the World Bank to really use the capital and not keep it in the coffers. So yeah, that that's really uh, it's still there, and we are still there. It, it's Indeed, and, and Rachel Kite was also a guest on Cleaning Up. She was actually our second guest, one of our most popular episodes, and of course a fantastic friend, I think, of both of ours. Yeah. Um, but what? So we met around there, and we were talking. We talked about. Um, a sort of incubator program called Finance for Resilience, which I was setting up. And mm. um, we were trying to get you involved. I think we did get you involved at one of the New York um, uh, Bloomberg events. And then suddenly you were appointed um, by President Hollande. Suddenly you became, 2014, I think in June, you mm. were special representative on climate and representative and, and ambassador to the, to the Paris um, COP negotiations, and suddenly you were sort of elevated out of my sphere and, and uh, had this incredibly important role. Is that how it happened, or, or, or did I miss the sort of inside story? Uh, I think it was basically because when France decided to offer uh, the space and the invitation, uh, at that time there was no particular idea of what, what it was about, really. Uh, uh, François Hollande and, and in a way the foreign affairs didn't have any experience really on climate change. 
So uh, at one point in time, they just realize, wake up and realize, wow, uh, we don't know how to handle that. And it seems very, very difficult. So they try to find somebody. And uh, I was, of course, in contact with, with uh, President Hollande and Fabius from previous months saying we could have some ideas anyway. If I can help, I, I could be. And at that time, when they called me, I was in New York teaching at Columbia University. And I received a call from Laurent Fabius telling me I need you in Paris to do that. And I said, look, I don't believe I can do that. You know, there is a whole hierarchy of the foreign affair. I'm not from the, I have been working there previously, but I'm not in the family uh, really. And, uh, and you know, you have everybody to really follow you. So I don't think I can do that. It would be too complicated, too much transaction cost. So I, I can give you ideas, but I would not take the job. And so he, he continued, uh, asking and asking because he was really feeling that there was really a need to have somebody knowing the issue and knowing how to deliver the plan. And it happened that I had a plan for, for Paris already. So um, finally, we, we agree on the role and on the my capacity to really drive a team and not having any problem of hierarchy, uh, just report to him. And um, and that went very well, uh, but because I had the plan prepared, and why did I have the plan prepared? Because of all these conversations that I had with many, like you, uh, like of course the Idri team, and many many of course experience, and basically the essays and errors that have affected the climate governance from now many years, from the thirty years before. So I came with the plan, meaning that's the way maybe it can work. And so it was a very simple plan. Uh, we, we need really the countries to be in control of their climate plan. So if not, we we'll have all the sovereignty, take back control uh, concerns that were already there. You remember Copenhagen certainly in 2009. You need to have an agreement that really uh, is a um, as a framework that is solid, that's forced to stay. It's not a short-term agreement. It's there to indefinite life. And then you, you need to have what, of course, the big innovation I think I made as well was to say, we need to have a particular finance chapter. You, we need financial institution to be aligned. And that begins, of course, with all the pro and cons and the difficulties of the public and the private sector in finance. And then finally saying, if we don't have the non-state actors operating and, and in a way bringing climate action in there, at the forefront of their strategy, we will not get there because it's not a paper that will make action. That will be the people doing the job. And you have to convince the businesses and you have to convince the local authorities really to engage and to take commitments themselves. So that was a plan with my four pillars for Paris that I proposed to Fabius at that time. Okay, well that's, uh, so you, you had that plan in what 2014 so June, uh, before you started in the role yeah. and what are, can you just can you enumerate the four pillars just for complete clarity <clears throat> so and it's funny because one of the u.s negotiators todd stern wrote the plan on paper when we had dinner together the first day and so he, he told me he kept the napkin which I, have, I lost, but he, he kept the napkin. And oh, my wow. By the way, so Todd is going to be on this. Uh, I'm going okay, to do so cleaning up with Todd Stone. He's also become a very good friend of mine. Um, so I'm going to ask him about the platform with the plan. But just, just give us the four titles, just for the, the shorthand the version. One, the, the first, of course, was we need a, a solid agreement that's here to stay. So the agreement, the rules. Okay. The rules. Second, we need the national uh, plans. So what is now the NDC, NDC the national right. contribution. Then we need the finance institution alignment with the climate action. That was my third pillar, the finance. And the fourth one was a non-state actor's commitment to deliver action. And so Paris is all, all this pillar, it's not one. It has to be the combination of the four. So that okay. was a theory. Right. But it wasn't a plan. The reason I was pushing is, is I think it's really, you know, it's one of the things that I'm trying to do with cleaning up around that Paris agreement is sort of get the different accounts of it. Kande Yum Keller, um, Amber Rudd, uh, you know, as many of the players as possible, Todd Stern, yourself, Christiana. And it's just so fascinating. There's always some new piece that's added. But your plan was not a plan for how to get it done. 
It was a plan for what it should look like. Or was it also, uh, I mean, did, did the, I wouldn't say the ease, didn't the ability to get it done, did that flow straight from the plan? Or were there also some kind of clever tricks or clever thoughts that you brought to the process? You know, you have to be organized. So uh, there are these four pillars required for different processes because you need to have different actors behind each pillar. For example, if I take the finance pillar, you need to look what, how far we could get the public finance, first the multilateral, then the bilateral aid, and then the private finance, which of course, you know, there's so many elements, you know, the private banks and then the asset managers and investors. At that time, there was not so many. Unfortunately, now it's much even more complex to coordinate them. So the idea was to take all these pillars and to say, well, who are the players? Uh, the first play, the first pillar, of course, the framework agreement is, of course, a government. So you need to, of course, to write what has to be in this. And there are certain, the goal, the global goals, and of course, the series of what should, we should expect of that Paris Agreement. On, on the NDC, it was basically to understand how far the country and could convince countries that they can control their plan, but they have to have a plan. And they have to announce it and to be transparent about that. And of course, to connect the two, the agreement with the initial NDCs, this contribution. But then on the other one, it was totally new. So you have to invent processes and to, in a way, build on what was existing, some business association in the case of businesses, the world business, the WEF, et cetera, or in the term of local authorities, what could, for example, C40 engage a local authorities to do? So it was different processes for different pillar, but then you have to have the, the common message. And that was, of course, a trick to try to really have the message in a way written ahead to say what will be the interpretation of all the if the if all the strategy on these pillars succeed, if everybody agrees that Paris will be the reference, which finally we recognize five years after that's working. So how you you give us the similar the message, the common message, the communication. Yeah. And that was the idea that finally across all this, this was this it's a transition to the low carbon economy is going on. It, it is inevitable and it's finally a good thing. So that was the message that has got us through on all these pillars. And then of course the trick, they are different. Of course, you have to, to in a way convince government that they are the, the real ones and, and to play the big ones with the small countries. On the NDCs, of course, you, you have to, to have the big elephants to deliver, but then you right. have to use the smaller countries to push them and to pressure on them because it was not, enough anyway we knew that already and then there was a different element of in the negotiation of all this which is you you have to build a trust between people and people have to trust you that you would not cheat them you would not produce something they don't know uh, at the end of the day and you know uh, that was the first time even if some countries of course propose very very sketchy plans but that was the first time every country proposed a plan to yeah. deal with climate. And of course, it's a process. And, and the idea that it was a learning process, that is something that will come along and you have to repeat the exercise to learn and to get more information. And you know, I was so much inspired, Michael, by the job you did on renewable energy. You know, for me, it has a, I can tell, and I'm, I'm sure I told you already, but the fact that the information flowing has changed the perception that the information that the cost of renewable energy have been changing the mindset of this is too costly or too risky. That's my, my philosophy preparing Paris was we have to change the mindset. We have to change the expectation. We have to feel that people know that or feel that this will be the future and prepare for that. And you know, if you change the mindset and the expectation, well, reality follows and the action because behaviors follow. And for me, uh, that's why I think the idea that you have to, the information, the connecting the information that everyone understand, everyone political economy. Huh? Uh, I, I can give an example. In, in many other previous phase of the climate negotiation or discussions, Everybody knew the constraint of US. Everybody knew the farmers, the Senate, 
the, major, the super majority, but nobody knew what was happening in India and what was the problems that Modi or whoever could have or the Chinese political context or, or the European one. And so my, my obsession was, we have to make people understand each other the constraint because then they will find you know the zone where finally they can and it, again it was not to agree on a paper it was to agree on an expectation i don't know if i'm clear enough but yeah. for me the interpretation was as important as a text even if the text is important because sometimes when people want to go out you have to refer to what's written in there no and that will be certainly the case in glasgow but that the same expectation are, are in a way a combination of this very strong interaction. So that's why I think it's so difficult to prepare Glasgow, by the way, because of the lack of interaction. Yes, I mean, Glasgow, you know, we're, we're just uh, hopefully nearing the end of this horrible, awful pandemic, and it's definitely thrown uh, quite a spanner in the works for the preparation for COP26. But COP26, in my view, is going to be a huge success um, perceptually for most of the world, maybe not for the technocrats who will be kind of, oh, Article 6 and the finance and et cetera, but for most of the world, what it will be is the first five-year period after Paris, and it will be a proof that the ratchet mechanism, which in some ways is, well, it's the, it's the, it's the cornerstone of the architecture <laughs> that you developed. It's because the, 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 the fact is that those NDCs delivered in Paris, those nationally determined contributions in Paris were completely inadequate. Absolutely. But instead of saying those are inadequate, Copenhagen style would have been to say, no, we've got to get better. We've got to, you know, we, we've, we've, we've got to share out the carbon budget and then spend 50 years trying to execute. But the genius of Paris was to accept whatever plan countries came up with but to say that in five years time, which is now, you have to come back with something better. And I think Glasgow is going to do that. I think Glasgow is going to be seen as a success. Oh, that's good. You, you say that, Michael, because sometimes we are too much involved. And in particular now in my new role, of course, it was just like, uh, what next? And the best Green Deal, uh, European Green Deal possible, etc. Uh, but certainly what, what I, can, I can take from these last five years Paris resisted enormously and the resilience of the agreement is impressive. And my plan, which was Paris agreement is not about the governments, but is about the framework for everybody to refer to is working. You, you business or, or fighters for future in the street or whoever, everybody says that's a benchmark. You have to fulfill what you have committed to. So that's good because at least we have a, a common point, a common platform. That the second point was when I began to prepare the plan and discuss with the many main players, many had the idea that the agreement we took in Paris was only for the first five years or the first 10 years. And I said, no, we, we have to have a final one. And then I could introduce a ratchet mechanism, of course, because then you cannot decide for the next 50 years. And so this is working because uh, even if it's difficult, even, even if I'm sure, in Glasgow will not be at the level we need to be even below two, two degree uh, of global warming. But I, I do think that most countries feel the pressure to advance. And we have seen that on US, on Europe. Remember Europe in 2015, it was 40% of emission reduction by 2030. And 55 is really not the same. <laughs> it's really not the same. Well, and net zero, we now have 78% of the global economy pledging okay. net zero. I have a question about that ratchet mechanism. Um, we had on the, on the show, it was episode 25, we had Baroness Worthington, Bryony Worthington, who was the uh, lead author of the UK's Climate Change Act. And what that did, was enshrined the UK's climate objectives, first uh, uh, um, an 80% reduction in emissions by 2050, and now, of course, net zero by 2050, enshrined it in law and put in five-year periods mm -hmm. of review, which were legally binding, and there's the Climate Change Committee, which then has to um, sort of pronounce whether we are or are not on track. Did you know of that model when you came up with the five-year period and the ratchets? Was that... Yes. Uh, we knew the climate committee. I was a great fan of it. Uh, we, by the way, we tried to have the French one. We have the French one, but now very recently. 
Uh, and so the, the idea that this five years carbon budget for a country was, I think, a very powerful idea. Because again, um, I was from now, even much before Paris, but in particular preparing the plan, obsessed by the idea of the, the global goal and the long-term perspective, the pathway. Because it's not about one day, it's about the pathway. But then if you want a pathway and how the, the short term is consistent with, a, with a, the pathway and the long term, the net zero you, you are aiming at. And I can tell some stories about the net zero, by the way. Um, but then that this idea that you need, of course, a, a meeting point to revise your assumptions uh, was very much about we cannot have a carbon budget for everybody and then negotiate, but every country should have one and then revise it. So this, this was inspired by many elements, but uh, and already in Copenhagen, I tried to put that in the discussion in 2009, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't fail. But uh, I think uh, that th the UK inspiration was really interesting to look at, absolutely. It's interesting because I, from memory also, I'm just um, thinking back on the conversation with Baroness Worthington, um, what she also said was that she was inspired in the UK Climate Change Act by the commitment periods of the Kyoto Protocol, which was pretty funny because actually, I think of the Kyoto Protocol as being largely a failure. But if we can kind of draw out a thread of DNA from Kyoto commitment periods via the UK Climate Change Act and then into Paris, which you know, is uh, uh, working, then uh, maybe I have to revise my negative view of the Kyoto Protocol. Yeah, it's an interesting discussion, I think again, you know, even you can look at Copenhagen meeting as a, of course, a failure, but as well, you, we learn a lot out of it, a lot. And we learn a lot about Kyoto. Yeah. Uh, just, it was just too small. And we know we are not thinking about how much the emission could, should have to go down to go to zero. And so I think the, the main element, what the element of Paris is, of course, all what we have discussed already, but the idea to, to, to put in, in the text that we have, even if it's a very complicated and sophisticated formulation in the, in, the, in the Paris Agreement, but we have to go to net zero. And I was absolutely, and it was so difficult. It was a last, last minute negotiation on the last Saturday to get this done, because of course it was just a shock until, not the degrees were something already floating, but the idea is that you have to put a number there. So, so just, to, just to recap for the audience who are maybe not as familiar with the text, the degrees, and we talked about this with Cristiano when she came on Cleaning Up, uh, episode seven, for those any in the audience who want to go back and listen to it, the degrees were saying we have to go, uh, we have to get below two degrees and preferably to 1.5. So that was already, you're saying that was there, but then there was this extra bit, which I believe ended up saying net zero in the second half of the century. It's quite vague about when, but it is in there, correct? It, it is in there. And it, it was, of course, the idea is that you have to balance emissions with things, uh, which is the net zero, uh, by, the mid by, by the second half at the latest of the century. The 1.5 was not there before. Uh, that was, uh, of course, something that a lot of NGOs and small islands were pushing for. And that was uh, the new element compared to the well below two degrees C. <clears throat> so the conjunction of adding, of course, a more ambitious target with a temperature level and uh, having some kind of, in a way, very clear message that the emission are to go to zero um, because that was negative after, uh, uh, because that the, the, the phrase is just going neg negative after. Um, was that that was the first time that, of course, it's not a distribution of the carbon budget, but that meaning that everyone has to go to zero. Everyone right. has to go to zero. It's not somebody, you don't know who, but every country has to invent a new economic development model that go with zero emissions or net zero emissions. And, and the funny thing is, I remember a real, for me, a real sort of wake up moment was actually 2014, I think it was the G7 hosted by Germany. And there's this extraordinary picture of Angela Merkel and the other G7 heads, who are, of course, all men. And they're striding through an alpine pasture. And they said that the global economy has to get to net zero by the, the end of the century. And it was, I think, largely ignored by the mainstream yeah. press and the business press, certainly. 
it was just regarded as, you know, this is because it really looked like a picture out of Heidi or something like that. And it was kind of, you know, I just don't think anybody focused on it. And then, of course, you fast forward to Paris and suddenly it's enshrined in a treaty, 195 countries. And but it still only says by the end of the century, it doesn't talk about net zero by 2050 or 2060, which is where we now seem to be converging yeah, for Glasgow. And uh, because the, the combination was, um, it, it was not the end of the century, it was the second half of the second century. Half. But that and could then, be 2100 or 2190, uh, 2099. The second half is starting 2050, but it could be of course. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and then there is this long-term strategy that the Paris Agreement asked countries to present that has to be consistent with the global goal. Now, um, on the 12th of December, 2015, which is, I don't remember which day, the famous uh, was, Laurent yeah. Fabius um, gavel, the, when he, when he uh, I don't, you probably remember the exact date on which it was, uh, uh, in which the meeting was closed. But Wait. on the, sorry? Yes, on the Saturday afternoon. Saturday afternoon, but, okay, but on the 12th, I wrote an email to you. I didn't think you'd answer. I thought you'd be much too tired and, and, and uh, busy, but I wrote a very short email, therefore, unbelievable job. I am full of admiration. And you did answer the next day. You wrote, thank you. I can't believe it. I prepared myself to be happy but disappointed as logic of short-term interests prevails. And finally, it did not happen. I think you're talking about the disappointment did not happen. And it was beyond, it was far beyond my expectations. Um, do, do you, I mean, is that still how you look at it? It's far beyond your expectations. I mean, when you listen now, you know, Steve Jobs talks about joining the dots is only possible in retrospect. And now we talk about it and you talk about, I had a plan and then we did this and we brought these people together. But did you, you know, did, it sounds from that email at the time, contemporaneous, that actually you didn't think that you'd get quite what you ended up with. No, of course, uh, I, I had the plan, but... I didn't have any clue if I could make it happen. <laughs> so yes, I had a plan, but but the plan had little chance to to really be executed because everyone was very pessimistic about Paris Agreement, Paris uh, achievements. Why? Because uh, you know there were so many failures before. Everyone was wondering, oh, there will be a low key. Everybody want to agree, but something very vague. And just before Paris, some weeks before, there was a G20 in Turkey, and the G20 was a disaster in well on climate, where all countries seem to say, no, we don't, sorry, we don't, we don't want anything really strong on climate. So if you had been just in Turkey, you would say, oh, no, even no, no reason to go to Paris. So there, there was all the reason to block with uh, developing countries against developed one. Uh, all reasons to really not to have that, and in particular the more ambitious elements, these degrees reference to 1.5 or net zero, uh, even and, and the slung, all the package, which is quite complete. And so uh, I, I just and you know it it has played. There was uncertainty. I can tell until really 5 a.m. in the Saturday morning. I can tell that. So the last the last mile, in particular on the global goal was really, really very difficult to get in. So um, yeah, I was, I was, I was, it was beyond my expectation. And, and, and you know, when I look back now, even if I see of course all the delay in action, my frustration about how long it takes to do things and emission growing, et cetera, the things that we still are investing in oil and gas, we still are, saying that renewable energy is too risky. Uh, we still are lagging behind on really having decent buildings and efficient ones, still have agriculture sector that is not, so many reasons to be despair. But to, to see that this agreement, which what can do an agreement because many things has to be done outside of that, of course. It's not the, the alpha and omega of action, but at least it's reference for everybody and, and, and every actor. And I think that's really, uh, it's really, well, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of it. That, well, that's, that's um, a fabulous insight into the kind of risks that were involved in that process. Because 
I think particularly as we now move, we're now five, six years later and, you know, as time goes on and you have new people coming into uh, climate action and new people coming into the onto the scene and new leaders, it is, I think, easy to think of everything that has gone before as a given. I certainly know that when I, you know, arrived and started doing things on clean energy, I didn't know who Hermann Scher was and how hard he had fought for the uh, the feed-in <laughs> tariffs in Germany. I didn't. I just thought they were a given. Uh, and so I think a reminder that you know there is out there in the multiverse, there is a parallel universe where the Paris Agreement did not happen because something went wrong at the last minute, mm -hmm. and we would be in a much, much, much worse um, situation in terms of climate action uh, had that happened. Um, and I'm I'm actually fascinated by these kind of arcs of history where one one development builds on another and you know we talked about Kyoto to the climate change act to the ratchet that's in the Paris agreement and in a way it's a much bigger arc than that in my view it goes from the campaigners against uh, for abolition of slavery then it goes through suffragettes then it goes through uh, gay rights then it goes through climate justice and a lot of the techniques and even when you really dig in you find that a lot of the same people actually kind of handed the baton onto the next um, mm. set of players uh, and i find that i find that really fascinating because there is learning in society about how we address these kind of big problems and injustices it's very easy to get depressed but actually there is a kind of arc whether it bends fast enough in this case i don't know and i'm very concerned but there is an arc and there is learning wouldn't you think absolutely that's why i'm i'm really um fascinating to see again how everyone picks up a piece of it and bring it to the next level these young people this friday for future movement uh how they now uh, not only just pressure on governments and and take the street but how they now in their jobs they want result on what in the new in the new thinking and how many social innovation we are seeing happening um uh, it's a well, it's a fascinating period, like all revolutionary period. We are technological, social. We don't know where it goes. It's just very, very uncertain. But uh, I, I do think that it's really, and that's that. In a way, I'm now 70 years old, so not a young woman, and I'm really, really pleased and comforted by this capacity of young people, of course, young women in particular, because of course I'm very sensitive to this uh, connection. Uh, but seeing picking up the baton and go and and so um, I'm seeing the message is there and and I'm very happy with it. And and gender has been also a recurring theme on cleaning up episodes because um, we've had, as I say, we've had Rachel Kite, we've had Christiana Figueres, yeah. Amber Rudd was our guest on episode thirty three. She was the UK minister at, um, uh, at, at for the Paris Agreement. Teresa Rivera, whom you work very clo uh, closely with. Uh, and at the time she was, I think she took over and sort of ran Idri while you went off and did uh, what you did. And she's now the minister of, um, well, she's deputy prime minister of Spain and working on the transit of the ecological transition. We've had Catherine McKenna and Catherine talks about um, women kicking it on climate. So uh, uh, Claire Perry O'Neill, who's the later was the UK minister of climate and energy. Uh, she talks about the climate sisterhood and I think, and there's many others, by the way, who've been on the program who are not directly involved, Richenda Van Leeuwen and Sharon Burrow, lots of people I'm sure you, you, you know very, very well. Um, we haven't yet spoken to Connie Hedegaard, but I'm going to invite her also. And one of the questions that recurs is, you know, is it, is it, was there something about the sort of critical mass of women, and Hidalgo is another name, at Paris in this process, that meant that Paris worked and previous attempts didn't. Was it just an accident of timing? It happened that renewable energy costs dropped and because of new energy finance, Bloomberg new energy finance, everybody knew and therefore they were prepared to do a deal. Or was there a different style in the negotiations because of the preponderance of you know, what I consider to be these incredible women leaders? I, I do think it, it helps to have different type of leadership um, one, because again, uh, you know, in, in many cases before, there was always people or leaders in particular who want to be the one uh, solving the problem. And it's just too complex to have the one. It's a, it's a very complex, many layers. 
of economic, it just is everything. It's health, it's economic it's technology, it's sovereignty, it's climate just touch everything. So you, you can't be the one having the solution. So, and name, so name names, who are you thinking of? I, <laughs> well, I can say in, in, for example, you had the, in Copenhagen, the prime minister of Copenhagen at that time, of Denmark at that time, I forget his first name. Um, one, one of the Rams, Rasmussen. Rasmussen, yeah. Yeah, I don't um, remember. Anders, I, was it Anders? Yeah. Maybe yeah. Anders, yeah. I, I don't remember. But you have it as well, uh, you have Gordon Brown, you have Obama, of course, Sarkozy at that time. Everyone want to be the one. And, um, and in a way, it has happened so many times in this. And, and of course, you can derive this, this little bit macho culture until uh, the negotiators themselves and the, the one that the, the guy who want to be the one and to to have women in in key roles and we i will have been lucky to of course have christiana which of course it was a fantastic teaming with her and then had i had a uh, some delegation were absolutely controlled by women spain was a very good case it was the only women almost uh, that was a case of very powerful south african uh, delegation, uh, the minister as well as the ambassador was were that, all. That was, was it Dipuo Peters from South Africa? She was the minister of energy. I don't know if she was also climate or. No, or she was an environment minister who finally, okay. uh, sorry, passed away. I just forgot her name now. Okay. And and, uh, and then I have uh, colleagues from Venezuela, for example, that helped me enormously. Uh, a very vocal woman. Claudia, there was a uh, Colombia, the, the delegation of Colombian were all women, very, very, very powerful. And, and so I had a lot of connection with them and they have understood the style was bringing people together. And, um, and that, well, anyway, I, I'm sure that, that the style you, you, when you new operate like this and you begin to listen to people before talking, and uh, that changed things. And I think it worked and people recognize that. Because we, we have had also, I mean, to be fair, there, there have also been a number of you know, incredible uh, male leaders of that process around the same time and, and since that I've had on cleaning up. And I'm thinking of Johan Rockstrom, Fatih Birol, actually um, Ernie Moniz. So it wasn't, it wasn't as though the women sort of said, stand aside, you've nearly trashed the planet, let us take over, not by any means, but there is a difference of style. The men seem to me, um, as I've gone through this process of having these conversations, to have been more technocratic. It's almost like technocratic leadership. Mm -hmm. Not they haven't been these, I'm not talking about the people who tried to be the one and, and push everybody well, aside and say, the well, way, the way they, they, were, they were more technocratic leaders. And the women uh, that were involved, the, the people I've talk, spoken about and, and whose names we've been using, they've had they've been much more almost like community or network leadership. They are they are people who reach out more and who build platforms that seem to be much flatter. Uh, so I, I, it makes an interesting observation. I don't know if it could be backed up by by analytical research. No, I'm sure I'm sure it can, and it is it is uh, backed by in, in many fields. And I, I think on climate in particular, there are now many studies that shows that that networking and you know where the style of convening is different. And the technocratic element is interesting because, for example, Ernest Brian contribution by the way to to COP twenty to COP twenty one, and I appreciate enormously working with him. But he has all the technical solution. And, um, and and then you know it's about the the way people see their future, and so you you had to in a way there is many elements in Paris agreements we recognize the difference in the different cultures. For example, the reference to the uh, the, the Indian the indigenous communities' perception in Latin America that nature is a mother, or that we need justice. Well, this is uh, was very anti-technocratic and mostly the technocratic elements in the negotiation said that very uncomfortable. Why have Pachamama in the Paris Agreement? Just because you have to recognize the culture and the links. And so for, for me, it was with uh, others very easy to explain. We need to make the space for that. And, uh, and, and I think that's a different leadership. You, you don't feel threatened because there are different formulation of the same thing you, you want to get. And that probably is this, the fluidity of connection. You, you yeah. in a way, prevails better than one formulation.
So I've done some climbing in Latin America and I absolutely um, understand you don't go anywhere without respecting Pachamama because uh, mm. you will not have a crew around, you will not have, uh, you're, you're not approaching it in the right frame of mind mm. and with the right teams. I want to just, talking about that kind of um, the justice uh, and inclusion side of things, because you are also sitting, I'm assuming right now you're in Paris, you're in France, but I mean, you were the French, you, you know, if, if you're not there, you, you are there now. Okay, so, um, and of course, France is also the, uh, that was then riven by the yellow vest protests. So, you know, why did that happen? Um, you know, is it that we were so busy worrying about including everybody else and respecting all of their issues that then there wasn't enough focus by those senior leaders in Europe? Because, I mean, OK, it, it kind of became the yellow vest process, pro, protest in France, but we have a lot of the same um, themes and a lot of the same tensions bubbling just below the surface in the UK. They're certainly there in Poland. They're certainly there in Hungary. They're in lots of countries. How does one... Uh, you know, ha have we missed a trick? Have we have we have we gone too fast? Um, and how does one actually make sure that climate action is not seen as a threat to developed country? You know, to those who are not doing so well within developed countries. Um, I think that's a central problem nowadays. Um, certainly, and you refer to that, Michael, very rightly. We probably have had too much of a technocratic approach all the time on climate, even the environmental movement. We are focused on targets. We are focused on carbon budget. We are focused on deploying technologies. And the social element of what will happen to people when this happened has not, was never at the center. And that's not only now very recently because we had these tensions or because now the climate action is biting really into the systems that we, we too late in a way, probably a little too late. And I'm sure Sharon Burrow in, in, the, in the discussion with you has raised that very, very forcefully. Um, uh, we haven't taken the problem of how it will have regressive or progressive impact on the different categories of population, one. And second, what is the future for, for the different groups and how they can in a way, envisage their future beyond the leaders, beyond the climate specialists, beyond the businesses that can have a strategy. So I think the yellow vest in France was the response to um, the mismanagement of the, uh, the carbon tax. Why am I saying so? Because uh, it was a combination with, of course, a higher oil price, with, of course, uh, the, the ramping up of the carbon tax, which was, of course, anticipated but with no, uh, no thinking about what will be the impact on people that cannot respond by, by the behavior, by, with the behavior change to the higher prices. And in a way it was presented by the Minister of Finance and the Prime Minister as it was a, a way to close the budget gap. So you have all the reason to have a, an explosion of anger. People could not change their way of life because they just were dependent on their car to go to work. They have old cars, they have diesel cars, and they cannot just they cannot switch to electric car just from, from now in, in a second. So, and then the, the, the first, the government was saying it's just to close a budget gap. So it would say the poorest households, the lower middle income groups are paying for a budget gap. And when, when, and that's why environmental justice is so important. When the people who are flying and taking the planes to go anywhere, don't pay any tax, don't pay any carbon tax. So that's not fair. So richer people don't pay that tax when they, and, and of course, for them, it's just so low, it doesn't impact when they take their cars. But for us, it's a matter of the really fitting the bill at the end of the month. So I think the, the, the idea is that you, you cannot, you can't just solve the social problem afterwards. You have to fix them before that. And I think, I know you have been talking to Teresa Ribera and, and the, the way she's dealing that with, uh, with and the government with the uh, regions, which will be affected by the closure of the mines and the closure of the thermal 
power plants is very clever because they are taking the problem ahead of what will happen. And if we have had strategies and measures and policy instruments to tackle this inequality of, of situation, when a price of a very basic consumption good, which is the way you, 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 you travel, uh, if ahead, we will not have that, that reaction. Second, it has been interpreted for many reasons it's anti-climate. It was not. People said it is about justice. It is about justice. It's about recognition and democracy. And that's why out of this movement of Yellow, yellow Vest uh, was created an organization which is a, um, the, the, the Green Vest in a way connected to these, the same people who say, we are not anti-environment, we are against unfair policy unfair uh, and regressive policies. And that's why finally these people asked for the citizen, the creation of the Climate Citizen Assembly, asking Macron, the president of France, to allow citizens really to have a, a look at the policies and propose strong measures to say, we can have citizens supporting strong environment position and, and action and policies, but with an element of fairness. And that's why the citizen assembly was created and my, uh, the president Macron accepted that. And I was very, very lucky to chair, to co-chair that process together with another colleague. Um, and, and I think that, so the Yellow Vest movement is a re reclaiming democracy in front of injustice. It's not about anti-environment. And when you do surveys, you have 65 to 75%, depending on, of, on the uh, age, that says climate change is as important as jobs and as security in France, but that's even the case all over Europe. So uh, it, it, you can present that if it fits you well because you don't want to do anything, but that was not what the movement was meaning. So that's, a, I mean, it's a brilliant analysis of what went wrong and also a, a pathway perhaps to avoid or to, to correct it. Um, I wish I was as confident as you that it can be corrected and that there isn't just, you know, because 65%, um, you know, saying we've got to do something, there's still 35% that doesn't think so. And we know that that's enough to disrupt, you know, a country and an economy. In the UK, we're seeing huge pushback that's being orchestrated, that's just building against electric cars and against, um, you know, clean heating, because these are very disruptive changes, as you say, in people's lives. Um, so. I do worry, and by the way, a, a much higher power than me, Arnold Schwarzenegger worries that most of what we've been talking about would go completely over the heads of most people, uh, and particularly anybody who's you know struggling to put you know to 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 you know make ends meet, to put food on the table, to pay for the weekly uh, shopping, they don't understand COP twenty sixes. I mean, there's there's a, a brilliant talk, uh, a keynote that Schwarzenegger gave um, this year, at the opening of an event in Austria. And he just says, you know, we're kidding ourselves here that none of this resonates. None of this really resonates. Um, what, I don't know, I, I'm not sure how to turn that into a question. So you've been quite confident that it can be addressed. Um, is it possible that it's just sort of too difficult or at least too difficult to address it at the speed that is required for climate action, you know, to get to net zero by 2050 might be just <clears throat> too hard socially. So it's one, I think the central question is there and, and we have neglected for too long and we have been talking to ourselves too long uh, in spite and, and not talking to the, the rest of the society, which of course is not in our just concerns. Where I am, I maybe diverge, I haven't listened to, uh, Swagenero's speech, but I, I do think that at least when I look at Europe, but I think many echoes that people are concerned with climate change in many, many countries. So that is different from 10 years ago. That's for sure. People are concerned about the impacts. They, they relate now the extreme weather impacts with climate change. They are concerned about that. And they are concerned about their relation with nature. So that's a new thing. Now, have we invented the policies that are not regressive to deploy such technological and, and social revolution? 
That's a big question because that's about the inequality that, that is built in in the system. So yes, we can probably we can invent already measures to you know like compensate that. For, you you know Canada is doing it, sending check beforehand yeah. before the people yeah. fee, fee and dividend, so carbon tax, but then rebating it per capita feels like a very interesting approach to defusing some of these uh, problems. Yeah, and and with people receiving the money even before they have to pay for their gasoline over there. So I think that can help. I think there is a limit to that that will probably not resolve all the problem we have of transition in region, jobs, creation. And the fact that at the same time, we, we in the last 15 years, inequality has raised everywhere in countries, not only between countries. And in a way, if not some between countries, it has sometimes, and at, at least for a certain period of time, uh, narrow, is have been narrower, but in countries, the inequality has just exploded. And that's the problem. You cannot have, how we can have big changes in a society where we want to go somewhere. It's not a change, we, you don't know where to go. We have to go there. We have to go to net zero. And at the same time, in a moment where people feel that the system is totally broken and unfair, that I don't have a response. But if putting justice yep. and fairness and discussing with people what the fairness is, uh, the, the, the vision of fairness is to me totally central. It cannot be top down. Yeah. Now that, that's a fabulous setup for an episode that we're gonna have later in the year uh, with Mariana Mazzucato, um, who I'm, I don't know if you've met, but uh, yeah. she's the economist working on these uh, uh, questions of equity and fairness and also mission-driven uh, approaches to addressing climate change. And Mariana, I agree with, very robustly on um, half of what she says, and I very much disagree on half. I'm not sure if half is the right ratio. Maybe I agree with 75% and I disagree on 25, but we'll see in that episode. Um, we're close to the end of the time allotted, and I just want to finish by asking, you know, we've got um, COP26 Glasgow coming up in November. We're less than 100 days away. The president of that is Alok Sharma, the... Um, the, the high level champion for climate action is Nigel Topping. Um, what advice would you have or do you have, because you're now, you're still working on these same issues from within uh, the European Climate Foundation. Um, what advice do you have for them for a successful outcome? So <clears throat> uh, the first one, and in a way it goes with Nigel Topping as well for Alok Sharma. I, I, I said that to them already, uh, several times, uh, you have to, of course, to deliver the best you can, and at the same time, tell the truth, not, not invent things we are not delivering. And it's good if there is truth in what you say, for example, for Alok Sharma saying we do the best and pressing countries that they have to deliver more on ambition, uh, pressing on finance, and having really all these actors who are not doing enough just to do the job properly. Um, but at the same time, recognize that you may not be there in Glasgow and not paint a success of something that's not there, but that what is a, the gap and where and how we, we, we can fill it. So that the first advice is be trustful and be, be really uh, speaking the truth to everyone. And, and that's as well for the integrity of the private sector commitment that Nigel is, is doing so well having with this race to zero. Uh, really preventing companies and, and, and financial actors to greenwash, uh, as well as uh, for, com for government really to say, okay, recognize that they are doing better, but that's not enough as well. So I think that that will build a sort of yes, in a way, this is serious. This is not, again, green paint on something that is not, because the anxiety is there. Anxiety of the public and uh, is there. So the so second element I think is really to uh, to see the process as um, well, and that of course for mostly government, they 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 have to commit to uh, again, and in, in the case of Alok Sharma, they have to commit to come in twenty twenty three with even better numbers, and and that that is really important. And so uh, uh, I think it has to be very clear on the deadline. Okay, you did better. 
it's yeah. not enough. You know that you, you commit to net zero. Most countries would have committed to net zero by 2050, which is really good. Most countries would commit and recommit, even if it's not a given, that 1.5 is the, the target we should aim at. But then you, you, have to, you have to say what you would do next, because nobody would be happy with what we ever get totally in Glasgow. And if, I think that could be a very, very powerful message of Glasgow. We have made progress. We are not there. We are serious. We are speaking the truth to everyone. I think that may be the major advice I could give. It's a, it's a moment of truth for everyone, really. Yes, I think that's right. That resonates with me that um, you know, it's not necessary to come out of Glasgow having solved every problem. There is the beautiful five year ratchet that you put into the Paris Agreement. So it has to be better. We have to see that arc bending. And as long as it's bending um, credibly and, and substantially uh, and it sets up the next phase to do more, to me, that's a huge win. Um, and so, you know, I, I guess I look at it and say, well, I wouldn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Not everything has to be solved. Uh, no. The general public is not going to worry about whether Article 6 is, is signed and sealed with a dot and a t cross T's and whatever. They just don't know what that's about. And frankly, I'm not just talking about the general public. I'm talking about the financial community. Most people in finance have no idea about Article 6 and don't care. And it wouldn't affect their daily life, whether it was you yeah. know, done or not. The momentum, the direction of travel, the inevitability of net zero in a ever ever closer time frame, that's what gets people, you know, uh, concerned or, 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 or active. No, I think that the, the way that this horizon is now more concrete, now we can put numbers which were impossible to put in Paris because that was too new, that the net zero meaning uh, decrease of emissions, uh, by 2050, really net and then get negative after is now something that is integrated in the um, many actor strategy is just a totally a change. Now, I think we, we have to keep the pressure before Glasgow, uh, because of course, uh, we cannot just say that's good for 2050 and then do nothing for the next 10 years. That's not possible. The short term action is really the decisive one. That's right. We are in a decade of consequences, as Winston Churchill, who's politically incorrect, but still had a great way with words, uh, once said. So, um, Laurence, it's a fantastic pleasure to see you. Thank you so much for spending time with us uh, here today. I very much hope that you will yourself make it to Glasgow, the COP26. I will be there for sure. As long as something bizarre doesn't happen on the COVID front, I will be there. Uh, and I hope to host you at the events that I'm going to be uh, attending and helping to organize just outside Glasgow, uh, putting something pretty spectacular together, of which I will certainly well watch this space for the audience. And for you, Laurence, you'll get an invitation without question. So I will be very happy to be there together with you and see you in Glasgow. And I think we have to help all what we can in, the, in this last weeks and months just to get that the best result possible. Very good, very good. I look forward to it already. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for this invitation and this very nice conversation. So that was Laurence Tubiana, former climate change ambassador of France and special representative to the COP21 Paris climate change negotiations. My guest next week is the Right Honourable William Russell, Lord Mayor of London. Please join me at this time next week for cleaning up.